Hi there everyone, welcome back to Higher Biology. So today we're going to be continuing with Unit 2 and we're going to be going on to Key Area 4, Metabolism in Conformers and Regulators. So we're still talking about metabolism, we're still talking about metabolic rate, but we're talking about comparing them between two different types of organism that you might have heard of before, conformers and regulators, and we're going to talk about how we are affected uh, by environmental changes and how we respond to them. So let's get started with these environmental factors. So the ability of an organism to maintain its metabolic rate, uh, keep it at a level, is affected by external abiotic factors. So going back to Life on Earth, National 5, you might remember that some abiotic factors, maybe like pH, temperature, there's also salinity as well, which is the salt concentration. Uh, we're going to really focus on temperature throughout higher biology and we're going to discuss uh, some responses to both an increase and a decrease in temperature. However, animals and plants are able to adapt to these changes by either avoiding it, but also by either conforming or regulating themselves, so conformers and regulators. So let's take a look at comparing them. So first of all, a conformer. A conformer is an organism whose internal environment, so their inside environment, is totally dependent on the external environment. They are not able to alter their own metabolic rate by their physiological mechanisms. So they cannot make their metabolism go up or down. It is totally affected by the external environment. So in this diagram on the right here, you can see the large amount of mass which if you look at the correlation between their body temperature and the environmental temperature, it totally follows each other. So when the environmental temperature is cold, the body temperature of the bass is cold. When the environmental temperature is high, the body temperature is high. And that would be an example of a conformer. It conforms to the environment. So basically, as the level of a factor in the external environment increases, the factor in a conformer's internal environment increases. So we look there at, uh, for example, temperature. When temperature increases, the temperature inside the conformer also increases. Now, in terms of their behavior, some conformers have to make behavioral, uh, behavioral sorry, responses in order to tolerate that variation. So if it gets too hot or if it gets too cold. And this is to maintain optimum metabolic rate because you want that, op that best, that optimal metabolic rate in order for you to survive. You can't survive if it gets too cold, you can't survive if it gets too hot, but if you're entirely reliant on what the external environment dictates, you have to try and uh, change that in some way. So for example, lizards, you may see them or you may have seen images of them basking in the sun, and that's them absorbing heat energy. So that's them trying to make the most of the hot environment trying to take in that heat to warm themselves up. However, when it gets too hot, they are also able to burrow into the sand in order to cool down. If they just stayed out in the sun and took in all that heat, they would get to a point where it would be past that optimum metabolic rate, it would be too hot for them, and they could die. So they have to cool themselves down. But because they cannot cool themselves down internally, they have to go and change their environment to cool themselves down. So there are advantages and disadvantages to being a conformer. And this is one of the main things you could be asked to do is to compare conformers and the regulators that we're going to look at. The first advantage is after us talking about uh, metabolism is that they have very low metabolic costs. So that saves a lot of energy by being a conformer. You're not having to put a lot of energy into making sure your internal environment is always at that internal rate and make it rise or fall yourself. The disadvantage of this though is the organism is now restricted to a really narrow ecological niche, so an area that it can live in and it's less adaptable to any sort of environmental change. So for example if there was a colossal change in temperature or other form of external factor it would not be able to adapt to that. Uh, there's only a small niche that they can live within. So that is a massive disadvantage of them in terms of where they can live. Now, as I said, um, we're now going to look at regulators. Regulators 
are a bit different. So regulators are organisms which use energy from their metabolism that we've looked at to maintain their internal environment at that steady state or that optimal rate that we've spoken about. And that is regardless of changes to their external environment. So again, let's look at temperature and the example here is a river otter, which is a regulator. You can see just by looking at the line that it's staying pretty constant. It's high, it's much higher than the conformer, but it's staying at that rate. So even when the temperature is very low in the environment, the internal temperature of the otter is pretty high. And as that temperature increases to a higher level, the river otter's, uh, otter's internal temperature stays roughly the same. It stays within that range. So this is what we've just looked at here. Again, the correlation between the external environment and the internal environment is totally different from conformers. So as the level of an external factor in the environment increases, the factor in the regulator's internal environment stays constant. So the obvious example here is talking about us. Our body temperature has to stay around about 37 degrees Celsius for that optimum metabolic rate where our enzymes can function. If you go outside right now and it's minus five, you're going to be cold, and we're going to talk about the effect on your body, but your internal environment is still going to be regulated to 37 degrees Celsius. Your internal temperature is not going to plummet. You're going to stay the same. You're going to be putting energy into making sure you stay the same. The same if you went inside and someone turned up the, the thermostat. If it got really hot, again, there'll be physiological changes to you, but your internal conditions are going to be staying at 37 degrees Celsius. You're not entirely dependent on what the external environment is. So the advantage of that is that your organism, kind of the opposite of conformers, is able to live in a really wide range of ecological niches because you're able to change your internal um, temperature, for example, or metabolic rate in order to survive in an area which is very different externally. The disadvantage, again, the distinct opposite of conformers, is this has a very high metabolic cost. It takes a lot of energy to be able to do this, but the advantage is you can live in a much wider range of ecological niches. So as we move on now, we're going to look at how your body responds to these changes. So there's this term we're going to be looking at and mentioning a few times called homeostasis. And there'll be a few new words for you to learn here. So first of all, containing that, uh, maintaining sorry, that constant internal environment, regardless of what's going on in the external environment, is called homeostasis. Now homeostasis, maintaining that level that we've spoken about, requires energy from metabolism, so high metabolic costs going on. It's controlled by a principle called negative feedback, which we're going to look into. And it's essential in another process here that we're going to look at called thermal regulation. But for now, I need you just to know that homeostasis is the maintenance of your constant internal environment. Okay, and again, that is regardless of what's happening outside your own environment. So this negative feedback, we're looking at an example here. It's a system that's made up of things called receptors, which you may have heard of before, messages and effectors. And we use, or regulators, use this system of negative feedback in order to respond to changes in the environment to achieve homeostasis. So we're constantly feeding back on what is going on in the external environment, how it is affecting us, in order to make sure that we stay at that constant internal rate. And we're going to look at how this works just in a second. So basically, if a factor increases, again, let's think about temperature, if it gets too hot and it goes above a certain threshold, a certain limit that would cause an issue for us, mechanisms are going to be stimulated, things are going to happen in our body in order to make sure we can decrease that factor. So if the temperature gets too high, we want to see how can we lower that temperature. The opposite is also the same. If a factor, again temperature, decreases too much, if it gets too cold, then those mechanisms are going to come in, they're going to be fed back in order to increase that level, back to what we call a set point. So the set point is that constant rate that we always want to achieve in our body. So the set point is that normal level of factor in the body. So if you look at this diagram here, and I've included some terms here just to help you out for your notes. 
if we have that normal, that set point that we always want to be at, your receptors are able to detect the level of a factor. So again, let's think temperature because that's what we're going to focus on. So your receptor is going to be constantly monitoring what the temperature is. If there is either an increase or a decrease, the messages are going to be sent from the receptor. Now, there's different messages. We talk, talked about this in National 5, in Control and Communication. It could be nervous impulses or it could be hormones, depending on what it's going to be stimulated. So these messages get sent off to effectors, and effectors are parts of the body which carry out a response. And that response is going to set that level back to the set point. So if it's too cold, there's going to be a message sent from the receptor that says it's getting too cold, and the effector is going to cause an increase in temperature to make sure it stops being too cold, it gets back to that nice set point that we want. And same as opposite uh, if it goes too hot. And we'll look at some examples of this. This is quite a good image for you to have down in terms of trying to get the idea here. And again, not to labour the point, but just to make sure you're all fine with this, is that set point is what we want to always achieve. We always want to have that internal environmental set point. So if a factor increases, which affects our internal environment, receptors send a message to effectors which correct that and they bring about this negative feedback control which means we get back to the set point. The same if we have that decrease in a factor which affects our internal environment, again if it gets too cold, receptors are going to send messages to effectors which are going to correct that response, bring about negative feedback control, going to warm us up and get us back to that set point. So again this is the same for, for anything involving homeostasis. Again, I have said we're going to be focusing on temperature, so it's good to just kind of get that idea. So just remember receptors, messages, effectors, and it's all about bringing things back to that set point, which is the process of homeostasis. So as I said, we're talking about temperature quite a lot, so we're going to introduce a new part of the brain. So again, from National 5, you should remember your cerebrum, your cerebellum, and we looked at the medulla. However, we have an extra part we're going to look at, which is labelled here, called the hypothalamus. And what this is, is the monitoring centre of your brain. Specifically, if we're looking at temperature, it's this receptor we've spoken about that's constantly monitoring what the temperature is, and it's going to change things if there's a difference in that temperature. So remember, the hypothalamus is this monitoring region of your brain. So, in terms of thermoregulation, which we mentioned at the start of homeostasis, this is homeostasis, but specifically for temperature. So the process of maintaining your core temperature, like we spoke about earlier on, at that nice 37 degrees, that optimum temperature, we need that temperature for optimum enzyme activity to maintain metabolism. So we've looked at how enzymes affect our metabolism, so they need to work at their optimum rate. But we also need it for high diffusion rates. Again, for metabolism, it's really important that we have these high diffusion rates. So if the temperature was either too far above or below our optimum temperature, then we are not going to have that optimal enzyme activity and we're not going to have the high diffusion rates. And that's going to have a massively negative impact on metabolism, which you don't want. So we're going to look at three different parts here and how this works and specifically look at ways you respond to changes in temperature, which you hopefully know some of them, a lot of them are fairly common sense. But the process of thermoregulation involves the hypothalamus because the hypothalamus is picking up the temperature of uh, your body and how to respond to it. And we're going to talk about nerves as well, again going back to controlling communication in National 5. And these effectors, and there's different effectors that are going to provide different responses to your warming up or cooling down your body. So as we talked about, receptors in the hypothalamus would detect a change in your body temperature, either too high or too low. When that happens, messages would be sent from the hypothalamus to effectors by electrical impulses. And if you remember, electrical impulses can go through the nerves. Now, once these messages, these electrical impulses uh, are sent through the 
towards the effectors, the effectors would carry out a response. And we're going to look at examples of those right now. And these responses are going to return body temperature back to normal. So again, through that principle of negative feedback, you're feeding back on what the situation is and you're providing a corrective response to it. So in terms of cooling down, let's imagine that body temperature has increased. Someone has went and turned up the heating and you're getting far too hot. There's going to be three main ways your body is going to respond to this through thermal regulation in order to cool you down and bring you back to that set point, that optimum temperature in your body. The three ways you would respond are by sweating, by something called vasodilation, and by decreasing your metabolic rate. And all of these are going to come into uh, to a system to lower your body temperature back to its set point. So let's see what they do. So sweating, you should hopefully think that if it gets too hot, you're going to start to sweat. If you sweat, then your body heat is being used to evaporate water in your sweat. So your body is releasing water uh, effectively onto your skin. Your body heat is then evaporating that water off. And in so doing that, it cools the skin. So the whole principle of sweating is to lower your temperature slightly. Okay, And that's one way that you can bring down your body temperature. The next one you might not have heard of before, vasodilation. And what this is, is there's lots of blood capillaries uh, in your skin. If they go through the process of vasodilation, and dilation meaning to, to widen, if you think of like your pupils dilating, then the blood capillaries dilate, they open up, and it increases blood flow to the skin. If there's lots of blood going that close to the skin, then it's going to radiate across the skin and be lost to the environment. By losing that heat, you're going to cool down. So it's a way of your, your body temperature cooling itself down by allowing lots of blood, lots of really hot blood, to go close to the surface of your skin and for heat to be lost through radiation. So it's not a way where, again, if you're hot, you're going to be sweating, you're probably going to be turning quite red. You're turning red because your capillaries have opened up, blood's running round your skin, and there's heat being lost to the environment. And finally, the last one is decreased metabolic rate. So as we've spoken about before, metabolic reactions generate quite a lot of heat. So what can happen there, if, if you want to cool down, or if your body is trying to make you cool down, your metabolic rate can decrease slightly. And if you decrease the metabolic rate, then that's going to reduce the amount of heat that is produced. And in so doing, that is also going to lower your body heat. Now we're also going to look at the opposite. What happens if you're needing to heat up? So if your body temperature is decreasing, say it's really cold outside, there's going to be a few more corrective responses that we're going to look at here. There's going to be shivering, there's going to be something called vasoconstriction, which is the opposite of vasodilation, and there's going to be an increase in metabolic rate. So some of these are just the opposite of cooling down. The other one is called the action of hair erector muscles, which sounds really complicated, but when we look at it, it's going to make a lot of sense to you. So as I've said, these responses to your decrease in temperature uh, are going to have this effect of trying to heat your body up and get you back to your set point. So let's take a look at them. So shivering, again, if you're cold, you'll be far, one of the first things you'll be doing is shivering. Like if you're too hot, you'll be sweating. So shivering is this involuntary contra eh, sorry, contraction of your muscle tissue. So you're constantly shaking effectively. And what that does is generate heat. You're making yourself warm up just slightly. The other one, so we talked about vasodilation, if you're trying to cool yourself down, this would be the opposite, vasoconstriction. So your capillaries constrict, they try and decrease the blood flow to your skin because you don't want the blood flow going close to your skin and losing that body heat radiating out. So instead, the capillaries are constricted to stop that blood flow, which means this decreases that heat that is lost by radiation. So the blood's sort of moving further away from your skin. You're trying to retain all that heat. Now this one that I talked about in terms of hair erector muscles, all that means is your hairs stand on end. So your hair erector muscles would contract and what that does is if they contract, the hair in your body would stand up. 
Now, if it stands up, the idea is it traps an insulating layer of skin. So between the end of the hair and your skin, there'll be some air that is trapped there. If the air is trapped there, that's going to be another form of insulation, which is going to keep you warmer from your external environment. So another way of trying to heat yourself up. And finally, again, the opposite of if you're trying to cool yourself down, if you're trying to heat yourself up, your metabolic rate will increase. If your metabolic rate increases, then you're going to generate more heat. And this is going to increase your body temperature and it's going to try and get you back to that set point. And again, this is one little diagram that might be really useful for you. It kind of summarizes a lot of these, uh, the way we were talking about them. So if you had your normal body temperature, for example, and there was cold conditions, remember your hypothalamus is what's going to detect this change and it's going to send these impulses. And your skin can respond by, uh, for example, not sweating as much. We talked about vasoconstriction. It could also try and raise your metabolic rate. Uh, you could raise your hairs for that insulating level, and you could also shiver. So there's loads of different things that can happen. The idea behind all of that is that you gain heat, and if you gain that heat, then you come back to that normal body temperature. And the same on the left-hand side if it's warm conditions. So this is just something that might be quite useful for your revision of this area, just to try and summarize what actually happens to your body, what responses you use in order to try and either heat yourself up or cool yourself down. It might be a bit useful for you. And that's all you need for this key area. So hopefully you found this useful, but in terms of key area four, you need to know what conformers and regulators are. You need to know how they respond and how they are potentially controlled by their external environment. And then when we look further at regulators, we have a look at the process of homeostasis and we look at thermal regulation. Make sure you're totally comfortable with the responses that your body uses in order to uh, try and warm yourself up or cool yourself down. Uh, but mostly, a lot of this should be fairly straightforward, just kind of adding to some of your previous knowledge as well. As always, folks, thank you so much for listening in. Uh, I'm working my way through these Unit 2 uh, PowerPoints, and we'll get you Unit 3 coming up very soon as well. I uh, hope we get through these very quickly. Uh, thanks, as always, for anyone who's sent me messages. I really appreciate people getting in touch, saying that they find it helpful. That really does mean a lot. I'm very glad that you are finding these useful for your revision. So very best of luck with your revision, and uh, I'll see you again very soon for the next key area. Bye for now.